Welcome to Tell Us Why, a podcast for the financial freedom community. If you're looking to succeed in your quest for financial freedom, make sure you join us every week as we, along with our guests, discuss different stories of success, how they were achieved, and how you can do the same. And of course, we ask them to tell us why. Here are your hosts, Jack and Mike. Welcome to the Tell Us Why podcast. I'm your host, Jack Darable, here alongside my co-host, Mr. Michael Ketchin. Today we are talking with Jared Smith. Jared is a licensed CPA in the state of Mass, specializing in tax compliance and consulting for real estate investors. Also a licensed real estate agent, Jared helps investors understand the numbers and what constitutes a promising investment and then helps them secure properties accordingly. Jared owns and manages 10 investment properties spanning from north of Boston to Martha's Vineyard. He's a local boy, Weymouth boy. I like it. I can dig it. But before we get into Jared's episode, Mike, what's happening? I don't know much. I'm just glad we got this done in four takes. You know what I mean? Jack was having a hard time with the intro <laughs> read. Uh, we I are, actually we are... got through the the reading pretty well. It just <laughs> we did it four times. So we are uh, we're pretty excited. Uh, we're under contract on our uh, latest Airbnb down in South Carolina on the beach. Um, it's either going to be the smartest or dumbest thing I've done. So uh, definitely be sharing some of that stuff. But it's great. What do you got going on? I know you got some big news. Yeah, I got some big, big news. I got a uh, potential Airbnb up where I go vacation every year. It's actually two properties, looking about a million bucks. Got to thank Allison for my local meetup for that one. And uh, also my local meetup, um, potentially partnering. on. We got an offer out on a big... Uh, Right now it's 16 units, potentially up as high as 46 when we're all done with it. So a uh, big project again, locally from uh, Christian and my meetup. So not the Christian that was on the episode, another Christian, but uh, lots of Christians at my meetup. Um, oh. But yeah, so a lot, a lot going on right now. It's, uh, it's exciting. So and doesn't that speak to the power of the two of networking and getting out there like we always talk about, you know, you can Netflix oh, and chill sure. or you can go out and kill, you know what I mean? You got to. Yep get after and go crush and uh that's that's just great actually taking advantage of yourself and betting on yourself and speaking of that this guest was unbelievable the way he kind of had his focus so lined up is what really took me away where everything he's done is strategically complementary of everything from the cpa side of the business to the transaction side of the business to make more money to implement the strategies he saw from some of his clients to build out his own portfolio i just think he was super impressive and we had a great conversation with him Oh yeah. I mean, a thousand percent. I mean, like I said in the intro, like he's a local kid. Like I'm immediately after this uh, intro recording is done, I'm getting his number and I'm giving him a call. I'll be like, dude, you have to meet up, go to my meetup and uh, provide some value for all these guys. Have him go oh. there. Cause I promise him you can talk better in person than you do on this episode. So dude, I don't know. <laughs> it's broken up That's right awesome. Now. All right. But before we bring him in, should we hear what this week's episode is brought to us by? Let's do it. Are you sick of being treated like just another number by large insurance companies? Do you want a more personalized experience with somebody that you can trust? With Keith Monteith, that's exactly what you'll get. Keith is an experienced professional who can design an insurance plan tailored to fit your specific needs. With access to over 30 insurance carriers, Keith is able to shop numerous markets to find a price that works for you. So if you want an insurance agent that you can rely on and one that has your best interest at heart, then call or text Keith today on 978-241-2363. That's 978-241-2363. Keith Monty, he'll get you covered. Okay, so Jared is a licensed certified public accountant in the state of Massachusetts, specializing in tax compliance and consulting for real estate investors, and is also a licensed real estate agent. Jared helps investors understand the numbers and what constitutes a promising investment and then helps them secure pr properties accordingly. Jared owns and manages 10 investment properties spanning from north of Boston to Martha's Vineyard. Martha's? Martha's? Martha's Vineyard? Um, that's my hood, so I'm excited about this. I'm excited to get into it. Uh, but before we get to all of that, um, Jared, why don't you tell everyone who you are and uh, where your business is at today? Yeah, certainly. And thank you for the introdu introduction, Jack. Um, so I'm, I'm a local boy. I, I was born and raised here in Boston. I, um, I went to school for accounting and that was kind of, you know, the career path that I went down um, ever since. And so started out 
you know, fresh out of college, I, I was fortunate enough to, you know, land a job with some of the, one of the biggest accounting firms, uh, firms, PricewaterhouseCoopers. And I realized early on um, that the type of firm that you're with usually dictates the, the, the size and type of the client. So, you know, I was, I was there working on multinational corporation type things, only seeing a small piece of the pie. I realized early on that's what, that's not what I was, really was cut out for. So um, I quickly pivoted to, you know, working with a smaller firm. I went on to work with like a, a mid-sized regional firm. That was a really great learning experience, but still not fully, um, you know, what I really wanted to do, which was work with, you know, individuals, uh, small business owners. And so that's when I, I landed a job with a, a mom and pop uh, firm here in um, Hanover, Massachusetts. And that was one of my greatest learning experiences, which led to me becoming fully self-employed today. So today I'm, I'm the Route 3 ACPA. I, uh, I'm an accountant specializing um, in the real estate industry with investors, property owners. Um, and so that that's kind of where I'm at now. That's that's awesome. Uh, yeah, right there. Go, go, ahead, go ahead, jump in. You started at PwC, like you went with that big company and then you went down to a smaller company and then you went down to like a smaller firm and now you're self-employed. Why did, I guess, like I went through the same progression and I'm just curious if that was why you started like the big Fortune 500 company and then went down, went down a level, went down the next level and then decided to do the self-employment. Was that, was when you, why would you take that first job? And then I guess why, why are you, where you are now, I guess, how did you get from, from the beginning to today? Yeah, great question, Jack. Um, coming out of college and, you know, ha having never held, you know, a salaried position, that full-time job, those Fortune 500 companies, you know, they sound great on paper. And, you know, I, I remember every fellow student that I was in with, everybody's aiming to work for these big firms. No one comes out of college really thinking, I'm going to be self-employed and this is, how, you know, it, never mind knowing how to get to that level. It's almost like you're conditioned and, so, and trained. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, yep. I think there's a lot of truth to that. And so, so that's kind of, and I, I know we're going to talk more about it, but you know, that, that's part of the, the learning experience of life. And, and it's something that is hard to kind of identify up front. And many times you do got to go through the motions to realize where exactly you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that kind of led to what, what I was going to ask to piggyback off of Jack. One reason I was so excited to have you on Jared was I know obviously a lot of people in the CPA world. It's so funny to me. I think you're one of the first I've met that I'm so intrigued was how were you able to make the mind shift because a lot of them get it. They see the math, their brain works away, but they can't actually invest and pull the trigger themselves. How are you balancing those two worlds where you're also a full-time investor, an Airbnb investor on top of that, which we'll get into. How are you yeah. able to take that plunge? Because usually you guys have a lot of the answers to the test, but you don't always take the action. It's been my experience. I think that makes you kind of unique. Talk about that a little bit. So glad you asked that question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like no, a, honestly, yeah, Mike. That, the exact same thing. That, that's, uh, the, you know, <clears throat> I, I've had people tell me that I have a certain appetite for risk that many don't. Um, you know, being here on this podcast, I'm probably in a similar room with, you know, you guys clearly have certain levels of appetites of risk and, you know, cal calculated risks at that. Um, honestly, I think that's something that you're born with. Um, maybe certain experience, and if not born with, you know, you've been through certain experiences that make you comfortable with doing it. Um, it's not something everybody has, and um, but it's not impossible to get there either. So, you know, I think it just falls back on the importance of educating yourself, you know, getting involved in podcasts like Tell Us Why, you know, using your resources to, to kind of learn as much as you can. And I mean, if you have the gift of numbers, which I feel like I have, you know, being good, understanding the numbers, know what constitutes a good investment, it you can get enough information to, to eventually pull that trigger. But yeah, I've, I've had some pretty successful people that I look up to tell me that, you know, I say, wow, Jared, like, it's amazing. You, you're willing to take risks that, um, 
you know, I, I know others haven't or aren't able to do. And, um, you know, I think it's just something that, and as you go, it gets easier, Mike, I'm sure. And, and Jack, I'm sure you can attest to that. Um, but I, I think that's, that, that's the gist of it. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great answer. And, and staying with that, like I always tell people, like, you know, your, your CPA, your insurance uh, person and your attorneys, they're really team members. And like I tell people, right. what, what happens a lot of times is real estate investors, they're only as good as the information we give them, right? But at the same time, I also feel like sometimes like it happens with attorneys as well. They have all the answers to the test but they won't take the test, right? So sometimes like, does that ever come up? And I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but I never thought of it this way. When you're underwriting a deal, is it sometimes hard to make, you know, cause as a real estate investor, we do, well, at least in my world, we do a lot of creative problem solving. Like I'm literally, I hope I get it. Cause I can do a whole podcast episode. I'm literally <laughs> buying a building that's about to fall in the ocean for a half a million dollars I haven't seen yet because I think there's an opportunity. <laughs> And if I call Corey right now, I'd be screaming at me. But, you know, because Captain already thinks I'm nuts. But where I'm going with this is when you're underwriting a deal, how are you blending that? Is it a gift and a curse? Like, talk us through your process a little bit. Yep. So, and, you know, before I say anything else, I, I think, like, growing up, you know, I've always heard, you know, some of my elders say, they like, they have regrets. And, like, they wish, you know, I wish I bought more real estate back then. And, you know, you hear, you hear those things and I feel like, you know, they might say that and whoever's listening, it might brush over, but I feel like I've always listened to that and taken it to heart. You know, I don't want to be that person later on in life that, you, you know, failed to take some risk, especially when it's calculated risk. So now here I am, you know, I'm a licensed CPA, good with numbers. I know how to read, you know, read a deal. And um, if the numbers make sense, I think the mixture of those two things, if I see something and the numbers make sense and, you know, everybody has their own um, like minimum return on investment, like internal rate on investment, I, mm -hmm. I know you guys can attest to that. Um, but, you know, if you, if you see something that if it conservatively meets your minimum rate of return, for me, it's like automatic. Like if I see something that I know the numbers are working, I'm okay, you know, as long as I can get the financing pulled together, there, there's really no other hesitation for me around that. Um, That's why I'm the know. exact same way. Like if it if it meets my numbers, I'm like, done, done. I mean, my, my numbers are hard to meet, but if yeah. it meets them, I'm yeah. like, All right, done. Well, let's, let, let's do something here that we <laughs> usually don't do, but, but you both just said something very impactful. Let's talk about Jack. I'm gonna throw it to you first. I'm gonna throw it back to Jared. Let's talk about what you mean by your numbers. I want to go deeper for the audience. What do you mean by your numbers? Talk about that real quick, Jack. Well, I mean, even like for my original deal, my first deal, like I wanted to make $250 a month in cash flow. That was an, I think an 8% cap rate and a 12% cash on cash. Those were my numbers. Those were at the top of my spreadsheet. If those numbers turned green at the end of putting in all my inputs, like I was, I was doing it. Okay. Can even I jump like in? Um, let me jump in real quick. Cause again, we're going to go real deep here. Real quick, cash on cash. If Jack put $100,000 down on the property to make 12% cash on cash return, it would mean he made $12,000 of pure profit. That would be his return. All right, keep going. Um, so just going through that process, like I, I think I mentioned it on the podcast a couple of times. I went through probably 100, maybe 200 deals before I found that one. And I found that one, my numbers were green for the first time. Like everything was green for the first time. And then like, I went through the process and I was like, if I don't do this deal, I'm never doing anything. And then after that, after that, two months later, I got another deal. I'm like, my numbers are green again. I was like, I guess I got to do this one. And then two months after that, I was like, my numbers are green again. Like I got to do this one. So, and then I was like, I need to, I need to calm down. Like <laughs> I wanted to buy one a year for 10 years and I have three in the first six months. Like, this is not okay. I was like, I need to take it easy. And then but then like going through the multifamily. Life off the rails. Thing, yeah. Like, I mean, I'm a numbers guy. So like, if it, if it meets my numbers, like I did data analytics, business intelligence type stuff, it's not quite accounting. It's a little, accounting is a little bit more in depth, but like, if it meets my numbers, that's it. That's all I care about. 
Okay, so Jared, throwing it to you. Talk us through your process a little bit. Then I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay on this for a little second because I think this is great for the listeners. So Jared, talk us to you about your numbers, your process. Yeah, and I'm I'm glad you know Jack explained his method because my method is a bit different, and um, you know just like it can be different for anybody. I went into real estate investing thinking that I wanted a 10% gross return um, on whatever the purchase price is. So I guess you could refer to that as like a 10%, uh, not cash on cash, because even if you do have like a mortgage involved and note involved, I was looking for 10% gross return on whatever the purchase price was. So for example, if I bought you know a condo unit or a single family home, $300,000, I would want that generating $30,000 a year in rents before anything else was looked at. And, you know, clearly you have your, your operating overhead expenses, especially if there's a note involved, you'll have your mortgage, you know, mortgage interest, real estate taxes. If it's a condo, there's association fees, um, any utilities. So $30,000 a year on a $300,000 purchase or $2,500 of monthly rental income. That's what I looked for. So, um, you kind know, of like the one percent rule, yeah, like almost like the one percent rule oh, yeah. by definition. Uh, really good point. So, that I went into it not knowing a lot about real estate investment. So, as a novice real estate investor, call me that's what I looked for. And then, yeah, I this was before I learned about house hacking and, and the one percent rule, but yeah, that same idea as the one percent rule, and that's kind of what it evolved to and what I look for now because. Whereas I was looking for a 10% gross return, the 1% rule on an annual basis is a 12% gross return, which, so I had even a little bit, I was looking for even a little bit less. I was okay investing at a little bit less than the 1% rule. Yep. And the reason I brought this up and the reason I wanted to go deeper here was a good opportunity, I feel, to tell the listeners, essentially, we all look at a lot of deals and even my method is a little different than what these two guys did because we basically refi and roll. We force appreciation. So my, we can do, there's a whole webinar on my method if you're interested in that, but essentially you just talked to three successful investors with three different methodologies. The, the one commonality that we all have, and this is what you got to get to is you got to say no a lot, but when it is a yes, you have to be in a position to execute. Because if it's a yes for you, it's a yes for a bunch of other investors. What separates someone from going from good to great, what goes from someone from trading transactional time, working with someone else to financial freedom is execution. You need to be in a position to execute. So with that said, I'm going to pick on Jack here for a second, okay? Jack's growth going through the podcast. When, Jack, when I first met Jack, this guy – wasn't sure how to close on it, how to manage, how to do any of this, but he had his framework. His framework catapulted him to now. He's not worried about financing. He's not worried about any of this. That stuff comes with experience, but his framework of what he's looking for is still there moving. Jared, I'm sure it's the same on you. Like you said, you've grown, you've evolved, but now let's tell the listeners. And again, this wasn't even planned, but I just think this is too good to pass up. I'm going to start with Jared. Jared, what do you do? when a deal does check that box, when it is a yes, how do you move forward? How are you in a position to execute? Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree with you more there, Mike, but from an execution standpoint, once you know that green box is checked, it meets my minimum you know, rate of return, if you will. Um, you gotta know how to uh, you know, approach it, approach the situation competitively. You know, everybody knows it, it's a hot market. Uh, it can be a really tough time to buy. Um, I guess this is a good segue into the fact that, you know, I am now also a realtor. You know, you talk about evolution. I went to school for accounting, became a licensed CPA. I'm now a licensed real estate agent as well. And, you know, some of the value I provide is, you know, looking at the numbers, seeing to it that they work. And then, once, you know, I'm working with my buyer clients and we identify a, a potential opportunity where the numbers work, I go at it full force. You know, I get on the phone with the listing agent immediately, um, you know, let them know that we express interest in it. And so building off, of, you know, what the question that you're looking to answer, you know, like you said, there's a lot of no's. And, but then once you see that, yes, you just, you got, it's balls to the wall. You got to move quick. 
Um, if you're financing something using a mortgage, you know, you, you got to have that pre-approval in place. You got to know and be comfortable with, you know, what you're affording. And then um, you kind of got to know, like, you know, in this market, there's a lot of over asking, um, you know, competitive bidding. And so you, like, if you, if you are going to go over asking, like, again, you just got to fall back on the numbers. Maybe you can go over asking, but if the numbers still work, you know, that, that that's what's really important. Um, something can be really expensive, but if the numbers work, then, then you know that needs to give that should give you the confidence to move forward with it. So, um, whatever you can do to you know strengthen you as a buyer, um, you know do it. If you're a cash buyer, great. Um, you know, you, you, I guess one good thing to do is put yourself in the seller's shoes. You know, what would be attractive to you as a seller, and then if you're able to meet said criteria or, you know, however close to that criteria you can get, I feel like that would be a, a good, you know, recommendation on how to approach it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is that, yeah. Yeah. That's, I think you touched on a few things that are, that are really good from the investor and the agent standpoint. Jack, what is your process mm -hmm. like when you get a yes? Um, what well, so like my fu my funnel is my inbox my email inbox like I know Mike you're more of a verbal guy I everything like everything I get is in my inbox so I get emailings from brokers I get emailings from like individuals like everything that I have is in my inbox if it meets my initial passes the eye test like the area that I'm looking for maybe the town that I'm looking for maybe the neighborhood that I'm looking for and the price isn't a million dollars more than it should be. Like it passes the eye test. If it passes the eye test, I put it in my calculator. If, it passes, if those green boxes light up, my next process is, is either getting it under contract or it's firstly to go look at it. If I cannot do that, I want to get it under contract and then go look at it. So if, as long as there's not a huge issue there, then I'm, I'm rolling with it. Like maybe I'll have to renegotiate if I've already closed it under contract or if my offer number might be a little bit lower. That's where I go with it. And then after like the PNS is signed, I'll go ahead and try to find funding for it or fund it myself, whatever I need to do. Um, and then from there, close, operate, refinance, get my money back out and, uh, and do it again. <laughs> and, why, and why do we go under contract? <laughs> to lock it up. Because we're driving <laughs> the bus, we're yeah. not a passenger. If you get That's nothing right. else from this, I think I have yelled at people in my life, probably Jack, Everyone is afraid Perhaps. to go on a contract. What they don't understand is I am in a rush to go on a contract. Everyone thinks you give up control and you go on a contract. No, 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 no. I drive the negotiation as the buyer once I'm under contract. I'm in control now. You know, it's like that little meme, you know, look at me, I'm the captain now. That's when we go into contract, okay? I'm not afraid to retrade. I'm not afraid to do anything. The problem is if it ain't on the contract, you ain't driving shit. You need to change that. You need to understand that. So Go back, listen to that. So many excellent tips. There's a perfect segue into, into Jared, the other side of the coin. I know you're a real estate CPA. You're focused on tax strategies. Basically, real estate taxes are, are great. I'll share with everyone of the listeners before we get into this, something that I recently learned in a book that I, I finished, Daylight Robbery. I uh, cannot recommend it enough. Unbelievable book. The biggest expense of all of our lifetimes, and we never think about it, is our government. Your government is far and away your biggest expense as a consumer. Yeah. So if you don't wake up every day trying to optimize that expense, you are losing. I promise you. It might not be apparent. Look at what we're dealing with right now with inflation. It is happening. The only way that I know of to get back in the black on that side of the equation, because I didn't ask for this government, I was just given it, is looking at my tax strategies and my tax savings. Talk to us a little bit about what you do in the tax side of the business and, and how you're working with clients, Jared, and adding value. Yep. So um, I work, you know, obviously being in real estate, there's many people that are in real estate in different capacities. So, you know, I'll help other real estate agents with their tax planning and strategizing. Um, same thing goes for real estate invest investors. You know, maybe they bought their first condo or, you know, single family or multifamily, whatever it is, um, you know, there's tax benefits that come with it. You know, if you're renting it out, um, you know, all the expenses that go along with it, you, you can kind of shield income, right? So, 
you know, there's a lot of strategies around that. Um, and then, you know, with the more sophisticated investors, you know, guys who are buying, selling, buying, holding, um, you know, selling some things, rolling the proceeds into the other for tax deferment advantages, which is also what's referred to as the 1031 exchange. Um, I, I deal with all that too. So, you know, Mike, you hit the nail on the head. Their real estate and, and, you know, tax law goes hand in hand. And with, you know, your silent governmental partner always at your hip, you know, you, you got to try to do what you can, to, you know, to, to use that to your advantage. Mm -hmm. You always get this piece of flesh. It's just a matter of how big a flesh is it going to be, which unbelievable segue. I couldn't have set that up better. It's almost like we do this, Jack. <laughs> with that said, Jared, what is one book or resource you would want to share with the Tell Us Why community? So a couple of years ago, I was on my honeymoon in the Maldives for two weeks. And whenever I go away, I, I try to read at least one book. I, I don't do a lot of reading when I'm home because, you know, we all stay very busy. But whenever I'm away, I try to get one book done, which the book I read that trip was Starting Small and Making It Big by Bill Cummings. Um, Bill Cummings, if, if no one's ever heard that name, he's a local guy. He's from Medford, Massachusetts. He's a, a multi-billionaire now, and he's he started from nothing. Um, his you know claim to fame and source of wealth came through mostly through commercial real estate, and so um, just you know he wrote this book that just it's more of a biography almost. It kind of just talks about his journey, and um, it's just a great resource. You know if, if you're thinking about getting into real estate investing or you know, just there's so many business lessons in it and just lessons about life. And, um, you know, it, you can really, it helps you visualize and understand how he got to where he is today. And, um, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You do a brick by brick. We can all attest to that. But um, it, it really is truly an inspirational, amazing story by Bill Cummings. That was great. Have you ever heard of that one, Jack? I can't wait was, to check that out now. Was he the guy that started investing in Brockton? Do you know? He's more North, North Shore, Medford, Somerville. Um, you, you take a ride through Boston, and I mean, you can see some of his big commercial plazas okay. coming, you know, coming centers. Yeah, the coming Cummings center Broadway. in Beverly. Yeah, the coming yep, center Beverly. in Beverly. To him. Yeah, that's unbelievable. That's awesome. Uh, that, I, I didn't even know that. No local guy's crushing. I can't wait to check out that book. Bill Cummings, we'll definitely link to that in the show notes. Maybe get him on Tell Us Why. I don't know. He's like, yeah, just get, get a billionaire, you know? He's like, yeah, all right. Well, we'll try. You know, we um, can't help. You'd be surprised. He, he's come out, you know, I graduated from Suffolk University in Boston. He's come out and did some, you know, he spoke to us over there. Um, one of my classmates who was from Beverly, who works for his company, actually picked him up and he just rolled right in with her and I, he, he really is a down to earth guy and um, I wouldn't be surprised if he came on tell us why <laughs> well we're, we're gonna hit him up yeah. the sh shouted you out that's awesome all right yeah. Jack are we uh, ready to put him on the hot seat him with the big three it's now yeah. time for the big three segment brought to you by QS private lending are you looking to finance your next deal quickly and reliably with less hassle and paperwork? QS Private Lending is one of the oldest and largest hard money lenders to real estate investors in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Our quick and simple short-term loans require no appraisals and have enabled hundreds of builders and investors to profitably acquire and renovate thousands of residential and commercial properties. To experience the QS difference for yourself, call or text Luke Conroy today at 315-323-0250. That's 315-323-0250. Five zero QS private lending. So now it is time for the big three. These are the three questions we ask every guest every week. So I'll kick it off with the college question. So Jared, in your opinion, excluding doctors, lawyers, we get it. Is college worth it? In my opinion, college, you know, it's a loaded question where prices are at today. And, you know, just like everything else we've talked about today and in the past, you know, you talk about return on investment, right? I think that's the one thing, unfortunately, colleges have um, that they use to their advantage, right? It's like, you go to college, you get a degree, you get a good paying job, right? You know, say you make, you come out of college making hundred grand a year, maybe even 200 grand a year. They can justify these high tuition rates when, when you know, they can, 
almost guarantee or, or sell you on the fact you'll come out, you know, obviously depending on what you go for, but it's the people that come out of school making good money that I think the colleges use it to their advantage to justify the high prices. But with all that being said, and I look at, you know, where I'm, where I'm at today, you know, fully self-employed as a CPA, real estate agent, I wouldn't have been able, at least, especially from the CPA standpoint, to one, become a CPA without getting 150 credit hours, you know, from an accredited university. That's like part of the licensing requirements. But if I just had never gone to school for accounting, I never would have, you know, got the job at Price Waterhouse Coopers, which, you know, eventually evolved into me getting to where I'm at today. That all never would, I don't believe that all ever would have happened if I didn't go and get my accounting degree. So I think, you know, it really depends on what you go for in, into, you know, and the reason I started out as a marketing major, it was sophomore year, I, I made the executive decision to switch to accounting um, for no other reason other than I thought there'd be greater job prospect opportunities out there upon graduation. And, um, you know, it, so again, if I just hadn't done that, um, I mean, there's, there's plenty of other, you know, trades to get involved with. There's, there's a shortage of a lot of the trades out there that you can go to school for a lot cheaper. Um, but, you know, in my particular instance, I truly don't believe I, I would have been here today without a college education and going through that process. Yeah. I think that's a great answer. It's also a very CPA answer. So <laughs> every analytical, every Plug for the profession. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so with that said, what is one piece of actionable advice you go back and give to your 18 year old self? That's a great question. Um, I would probably say, and you know, I, I know we talked about my risk appetite and you know, going out there and taking chances. But I don't think you could harp on that enough. Is just when you're young and you have your whole life ahead of you, you know, even graduating college, you're still relatively young. Um, you know, don't, and if it sounds cliche, I apologize, but you know, don't be afraid to go out and make mistakes, um, take risks, you know, fall on your face, make those mistakes early because, you know, you got, there's no greater asset than time, right? So, you got all this time ahead of you. Make mistakes early, you know. One of the week bolt ties it really well right learn here. The hard, learn the hard way. Yeah, learn the hard way early. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I think that'll serve you well in life. I like it. I like it. All right, Jack, hit him with the hard one. I don't mean to mess up the big three, but what year, what year did you graduate from college? Going back to the college question. 2014. 2014. Okay. All right. I don't want um, to mess it up, but I will. All right, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm going to. I was, I was interested about the marketing to accounting switch, but all right, never mind. Um, what's one thing you would want your nine-year-old self to say to you? I think I touched on this earlier, but, you know, I don't want to be that person later on in life, you know, 90 years old is way later on in life saying, you know, I, I don't want to be that old and full of regret, you know, so take the risks. It all kind of interwines, right? Take the risks, you know, learn the hard way. Um, don't be afraid to do things just because of the potential downside. I think that's one of the other biggest things I've learned is everyone's quick to say, you know, to talk about the risk and, and you know, the potential downside. But what if, I feel like people aren't as quick to talk about the potential upside. So don't, you know, don't do anything because of some potential downside when it might have a tremendous upside. Very well said. Very well said. Jared, where can people get in touch with you learn more about you? Um, best way to follow me on Instagram at Realtor Jared. Um, you can kind of keep up with what I'm doing. Um, you know, if, if you're thinking about potentially investing and if you if you just want a, a broad overview of understanding numbers to, you know, best guide you moving forward, reach out. I'm happy to connect. All right. So before we let you go, is there anything else you'd like to tell our listeners? Um, probably nothing other than utilize all your free resources. I, you know, tell us why podcast here. You know, there, there's so much content out there. A lot of it, you know, is really good. Um, but we, 
live in a time where, you know, the amount of resources we have at our fingertips is tremendous. And so immerse yourself in it, take full advantage of it. I, you know, I've seen a lot of different podcasts, different, you know, resources out there. I think uh, I got involved with Tell Us Why. It's been one of the greatest. So de definitely take advantage of those resources. Love it. Thank you for the kind words. And with that, Jack, where can more people learn and get connected with Tell Us Why? You can go to tellusswhypodcast.com. Go to check out the new community forum. Uh, if you don't already follow us on social media, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, every social media platform there is. All the links are in the description below. Yep. Spotify, iTunes, leave a rating and review. Get connected with great guests like Jared. I mean, you just got to talk to a real estate investing CPA and agent. I mean, where else can you have these type of conversations? Yeah. So definitely check it out. Download, stream the episode, share it. Jack, quote of the week. Ties in perfectly to what you were talking about. Every day is a bank account and time is our currency. No one is rich. No one is poor. We've got 24 hours each. Christopher Rice. Boom. Nailed it. Love that. All right. All right. Let's do it, guys. That is it for today. Be sure to join us for next week's episode. And until next week. Bet on yourself.